right? Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, virtual talk. I'll be talking about um, some connections between sum of squares, uh, in particular, lower bounds for the sum of squares hierarchy based on high dimensional expanders. Um, and this is based on joint work with Irithi Noor, Yuval Filmus, Central Adarsha. And before we get to uh, high dimensional expanders, let's just recall expander graphs. We all know and love these objects. These are graphs which are well connected. There are combinatorial and spectral ways of measuring this kind of notion of expansion or how well connected these graphs. And they have a plethora of applications um, uh, to, to many areas, in particular, uh, de-randomization, metric embeddings, uh, pseudo-randomness, uh, coding theory. And then there is an excellent uh, survey by Huri, Linial, and Victorson, which uh, is, is a is a beautiful exposition of many of these uh, constructions and their applications. High dimensional expanders are just uh, expanding hypergraphs instead of graphs. Um, and there are many ways of uh, capturing what it means to be an expanding hypergraph. Uh, not all of these definitions are equivalent. And um, in particular, we won't need to know too much about the specifics of uh, these definitions uh, for, uh, for this discussion uh, during the talk, uh, but um, uh, just to say that there are many different ways of defining and expanding hypergraph. Um, and although these are kind of, uh, this is a relatively recent area, it's already had uh, a huge number of applications and this is just a, 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 a non-exhaustive list of papers uh, just to illustrate that there has been quite a few uh, results and quite a bit of activity, some of it quite surprising in the recent few years. and. Uh, in particular, today I'll be talking about some applications to constructing uh, instances which are hard for uh, certain optimization algorithms or certain families of algorithms. Um, and the problem we'll be considering is uh, 3XOR or the maximization version of 3XOR. So you are given M uh, constraints, which are of the form of linear equations over F2 in, in Boolean variables. Um, and in let's say the total number of variables is n, total number of equations is m, and their goal is to find an assignment to the variables satisfying as many equations as possible. Uh, alternatively, we can think of an instance as being described by a collection of three tuples, uh, script t, uh, which will form the left-hand sides of these equations, and uh, a function beta, which uh, for each equation gives you a right-hand side, which is either 0 or 1, or is a value, a value in F2. And once uh, such a collection of tuples and beta is specified, that's a complete description of an instance uh, for uh, 3XOR or max 3XOR. And the family of optimization algorithms we'll consider is um, something called the sum of squares uh, STP hierarchy. It's a, it's a family or, or a hierarchy of uh, uh, semi-definite programming relaxations, uh, uh, which, which captures many of the known approximation algorithms. It's a powerful uh, tool and we can think of it as a computational model uh, the, uh, with the complexity kind of governed by the levels of the hierarchy. In particular for constraint satisfaction, uh, the level T can be solved in time n to the order T where n is the number of variables. Uh, and we want to sort of understand how well this computational model or how much power does do we need in this computational model to obtain a certain quality of approximation. In particular for 3XOR, uh, here's the relaxation given by uh, T levels of the hierarchy. We don't need to understand the precise form of this relaxation for the talk. Um, all I want you to kind of see is that it's a, it's a vector program or a quadratic program in vectors with uh, one vector for every subset of variables of size up to T. And that's uh, roughly where the parameterization in terms of the levels of the hierarchy comes from. The larger number of levels you are looking at, there will be vectors for larger and larger subsets of variables. Uh, we, like, yeah, we won't need to use the precise form of this too much. There's also an alternative view of viewing sum of squares in terms of uh, objects called pseudo expectation operators, uh, but, uh, and then their equivalent, uh, the, the pseudo expectation form is more convenient for certain applications. Although, as I said, we won't need the precise description right now. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is that 
as I said, it's a, it's a powerful hierarchy. We know a lot of upper bounds or uh, many approximation guarantees. We also know quite a few lower bounds. Um, uh, but these lower bounds are essentially derived through some random instances or they uh, are non-constructive in nature. Um, uh, lower bounds on, on approximation, by the way. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of illustrate, I'll clarify that in a bit. Uh, this kind of either are random instances themselves, or you can uh, start with, let's say, a random instance of 3XR, do some reduction on top of it to derive uh, an instance of some other problem which you want to show a lower bound for. Uh, and when I say uh, this kind of approximability, uh, I want to distinguish between uh, cases where you show that the hierarchy cannot find the true optimum, which uh, can be shown for explicit instances, but in those cases, we don't always have like a large gap between what the hierarchy finds and what the true optimum is. Uh, these are things like Scythian tautologies in proof complexity, which are basically some systems of XOR, but uh, these are unsatisfiable equations, which are kind of almost satisfiable, but the hierarchy thinks they're completely satisfiable. So there is a slight gap, but not really a large enough gap that it gives you uh, sort of uh, some a constant factor in approximability result or any kind of in approximability result. Okay. In terms of gaps for approximation, uh, the previous known results for uh, 3XR uh, by Grigorev and independently discovered by Schoenebeck uh, are of the following form. Mm -hmm. uh, you can show that there is uh, an infinite family of 3XR instances. And in fact, these are just random instances um, uh, where you choose the tuples, the three tuples at random uh, kind of a fixed number of tuples, each uh, tuple chosen at random. The right-hand side beta are also chosen at random to be zero or one. And then can show that for such a construction uh, with high probability, it's true that no assignment satisfies more than 51% uh, of the constraints or half plus epsilon fraction. Uh, but, uh, and this is the kind of best possible because uh, you can always satisfy half of them uh, just by a random assignment. And on the other hand, the SOS hierarchy kind of fails maximally. It thinks that um, uh, all constraints are satisfiable or it uh, cannot refute the instance, which means that it cannot even prove that the instance is not completely satisfiable. So it thinks fraction one of the constraints are satisfiable. Uh, the instances I'll discuss in the talk are um, uh, constructible and deterministic polynomial time. They are explicit, um, uh, but they are weaker in some ways. Uh, in particular, the soundness or what a true, like what is you know, for true for any actual integer assignment is that uh, not that cannot even satisfy 51%, but you cannot satisfy something like 90% of the constraints. So think of mu as 0.1. So there exists this constant such that no assignment satisfies more than one minus mu fraction. And on the other hand, the SOS hierarchy still thinks that um, uh, the instances are completely satisfiable. It still cannot refute them, but this is, uh, we can only prove this for uh, uh, both square root log n levels of the SOS hierarchy as opposed to uh, n levels or sorry, omega of n levels of the SOS hierarchy, which was true in the previous uh, uh, results obtained via random constructions. Uh, some of, uh, uh, yeah, so a couple of remarks. Some of these things can be uh, handled. So in particular, this issue of one minus mu, you can get around partially by reductions. So uh, using, uh, can starting with the explicit three XOR instances and doing some polynomial time reduction on top of it, you can get instances where no more than half plus epsilon fraction of the instance are satisfiable by any actual integral assignment, but then SOS thinks at least one minus delta fraction of the constraints are satisfiable. Uh, can't quite take delta to be zero, but the gap qualitatively is still almost one versus half plus epsilon. Uh, and you can also use reductions to get gaps for a lot of other optimization problems. Um, uh, again, the number of levels still stay about square root log n. You don't get um, increased number of levels on the SOS hierarchy, but you might lose a bit depending on the reduction. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first explicit construction of uh, uh, 
integrality gaps uh, which show hardness of approximation in the SOS hierarchy. As I said, just showing that SOS doesn't attain, achieve the true optimum can be done with explicit instances. But if you want to show an approximability gap, uh, uh, this is the first instance as far as I know. Uh, and moreover, the instances are not just explicit, they also have an inter interesting structure. And in that sense, they offer an interesting contrast or maybe even an apparent contradiction to previous results where um, uh, a recent result uh, with uh, uh, Vedat Levy, Elev and Fernando Granaja Geronimo, we, we showed that um, three XOR instances on high dimensional expanders are uh, easy in the sense that a constant number of levels of SOS can obtain an arbitrarily good or one plus epsilon approximation. Um, in fact, this is true for all CSPs. But then here I'm telling you that uh, I can give you three XOR instances on high dimensional expanders, which are hard for even square root log n levels of SOS. Um, so uh, like what's going on? Uh, and both these results are correct. The, the catch is that they use a different definition of uh, on or rather what it means that an instance is a CSP on a high dimensional expander. And they, they use these high dimensional expanders slightly differently, which is a subtle thing I'll illustrate in the next uh, couple of slides. But uh, I just want to mention that kind of, uh, the instances here are not just explicit, they also have some interesting structural properties. Okay, now to illustrate the structure of these instances, let sort of or while I kind of mentioned the distinction between these and the previous algorithmic results, let me also uh, sneak in a little bit of the simplicial complex notation, which we'll use later. So a simplicial complex uh, is just a fancy term for a downward closed hypergraph. Uh, so think of a hypergraph as having hyper edges corresponding to subsets of the vertices. These subsets can be of size one, two, three, uh, but we will always consider hypergraphs to be downward closed, which means that if you have a size three subset, then it's uh, all its size two subsets are also present as hyper edges. Um, and in general, we'll refer to kind of size one subsets as vertices, size two subsets as edges, size three subsets as triangles and so on not necessarily in any geometric sense so far, although the intuition comes from some geometric uh, 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 connections, but uh, right now just as three tuples and two tuples, etc. cetera. Uh, and when we have a triangle, we also have all three of its edges present as hyper edges in our hypergraph. We will use uh, this uh, notation X bracket J to denote the collection of all hyper edges of um, size J plus one. And again, the, the, the discrepancy between J and J plus one is just coming from the geometric uh, intuition. You think of a triangle as a two dimensional object uh, and edge or a line as a one dimensional object and so on. And so X bracket J kind of denotes uh, the J dimensional faces of the simplicial complex or the subsets in your hypergraph, uh, hyper edges in your hypergraph of parity j plus one. Variables and constraints will correspond to kind of different uh, uh, sort of faces of different dimension uh, in our simplicial complex or different levels. Um, and, and, and I'll illustrate this as we, as we go along with different constructions. Uh, let's first look at uh, a simple way of connecting three XOR instances with simplicial complexes. So recall the three XOR instance is just a collection of three tuples. Uh, and an associated right-hand side uh, value beta for every three tuple. We can think of these uh, three variables as vertices of a triangle. So we can think of a simplicial complex where uh, all the variables are vertices uh, or the dimension zero faces of the simplicial complex. All the triangles, uh, are, are correspond to constraints and are the dimension two faces of the simplicial complex. And we have this beta which maps uh, uh, the set of dimension two faces to values in zero one, which corresponds to the right hand side. Okay. This is just uh, a translation or just stating things in a different language and not doing anything deep here. Uh, but for this kind of construction, uh, 
it is known that uh, known by, by recent results that uh, if your simply shell complex is kind of a high dimensional expander is, is, is a sufficiently strong high dimensional expander then such instances are actually easy for sos uh, and i'll refer to this as the vertex variable construction uh, and in particular a constant number of level levels of sos uh, can obtain uh, uh, a one plus epsilon approximation the, uh, to the true value where the, the kind of number of levels depends on epsilon. Let's think of another way of uh, uh, constructing simply uh, uh, 3XOR instances from simply shell complexes. So uh, a triangle has uh, three vertices, but it also has three edges. So the next construction I'll talk about, I'll refer to the edge variable construction. So now, uh, let's say given a simply shell complex, the X2, which is a set of three uh, dimension two faces, um, we are still going to think of them as constraints, but our variables are now going to be members of the set uh, X1, which is the set of uh, one dimensional faces or edges uh, in the in, uh, sort of one dimensional faces of the simply shell complex. So a triangle still has three edges, which means that we still have that every constraint has three variables um, and we will still will think of a function beta mapping x2 to uh, 0 1 or, or the field f2 so we will have um, uh, one right hand side for every equation uh, equation is just a member of x2 a variable is a member of x1 now and in this work we show that sort of this kind of a 3xor instance constructed from a specific uh, family of uh, simply shell complexes, in particular, the Ramanujan complexes of Lubotsky, uh, Samuels, and Vishne, uh, yield three XOR instances, which are actually hard for the SOS hierarchy. In particular, square root log n levels of the SOS hierarchy fail to even refute uh, unsatisfiable inst uh, instances uh, constructed in this uh, this way. So, note that up to the description of the Ramanujan complex, which I'm not actually going to give in this talk, um, uh, but it's an explicit and kind of uh, explicit family. Uh, I've almost completely described the three XOR instance, except that I've not told you what these betas are, which are the right-hand sides. The left-hand sides are all governed by the structure of the complex. We will come to this sort of beta a little bit later, but uh, I just want to illustrate the distinction between this construction and the edge variable construction where the variables are uh, vertices of the triangle and now in this construction, the variables are edges of the triangle. Okay. Let me say a few words about how the proof uh, works. Uh, and uh, if you've seen so if one of these uh, lower bounds uh, for, for XOR uh, uh, in the SOS uh, hierarchy, uh, all of these have the structure that the first step is basically forgetting about SOS. So uh, in particular, instead you consider a proof system, which I'll call XOR resolution, which is just, you look at uh, two equations and use them to derive a new equation by adding them. So you add the left-hand sides, which are L1 and L2, and the right-hand sides, which are uh, beta one and beta two. And the goal is to start with all the equations which we are given as part of our uh, uh, 3XOR or XOR system in general, uh, which we will think of as axioms. And we will try to derive new consequences of these axioms until we derive zero equals one, which is a contradiction. So we will have proved that our original system of axioms is unsatisfiable, or we would have constructed a refutation uh, for the given XOR system. Mm -hmm. And while we are doing this, we'll measure the kind of width of our refutation. So uh, any derivation of zero equals one can be viewed as a DAG, uh, uh, where we kind of uh, just kind of traverse the DAG to kind of reach the contradiction. And uh, the on any node, we will have an equation with a left hand side and a right hand side, and the, we will think of the width of the node as the number of variables in the equation written at the node and the width of the entire DAG or the width of the entire proof as the maximum number of variables appearing in any node uh, in the DAG. And a very nice result of Rigorev and Schoenbeck uh, uh, shows that 
if uh, low width uh, sort of XOR resolution cannot refute a given set of axioms or a given collection of equations, then neither can SOS. So in particular, if XOR resolution needs width that leads at least W to derive a contradiction or to refute, then SOS needs width at least W over two. So up to a factor of two, uh, sort of, it's just sufficient to shift to thinking about this XOR resolution proof system. And uh, then there's an argument of Ben Sasson and Wigderson, which uh, shows that random instances need very large widths. So in particular, if you think of random instances where the set of three tuples or the number of equations is of size some constant times n, constant capital C is chosen appropriately. Then uh, for a parameter r, which will be roughly the width uh, and, and can be taken to be uh, omega of n, you can show the following. So first, that uh, any refutation will contain an intermediate node, which is derived from roughly r axioms. And this kind of squig squiggly r I'm using to denote various uh, quantities which will be between r over two and r. So instead of having to write these kind of constant factors, I'll just call all of them as r. Uh, so there will be an intermediate node which will be uh, about, which will be derived from about r axioms in the DAG. Uh, and they also show that in a random system of axioms or in a random three XOR formula, if you look at any set of, kind of about r axioms, then there will be roughly r variables which will appear uh, in exactly one of these axioms. So if you think of set S of axioms, then uh, there will be roughly r variables which will appear in exactly one uh, axiom in S. In general, for set S of size up to r, there will be uh, uh, roughly size of S uh, variables which will appear in exactly one uh, equation or exactly one axiom. And there's something called the boundary expansion and proof complexity. Uh, and so the width of such a node is uh, about R or the number of variables which appear in exactly one axiom because when you add all these axioms, these variables will never cancel out. They, there is nothing else in S which can cancel them out. Okay. So such a node in the DAG will have uh, width R. So any refutation will, re will require width about R which means that uh, SOS will require uh, uh, at about R or R over two levels uh, to refute uh, such a system and R can be taken to omega uh, to be about omega N which is what gives the result of uh, Gregory and Schoenbeck. And here we will also prove that the instances constructed from this uh, Lubotsky, Samuels and Vishne uh, complexes uh, need uh, large width. Uh, now the width will be about square root log n. And uh, so we'll kind of have, we will be able to prove something similar in particular for R about log n. We can say that if you have a refutation DAG, then there will be a node which uh, uh, sort of uh, is derived from about R axioms. Uh, and the the, the role of boundary expansion and proof complexity will now be played by what's called the topological boundary. So we'll show that, uh, or it, it's sort of an easy consequence of um, what's called Gromov's filling inequality that uh, if you look at roughly R triangles, then there will be uh, about square root R uh, variables or edges, which will appear in an odd number of triangles. Okay. So, uh, and you can think of an edge being on the kind of topological boundary, it, it appears in an odd number of triangles. Uh, so roughly, though this picture is slightly misleading, you can think of this picture of kind of a planar grid where um, uh, R triangles can have a boundary of, have a boundary of size at least uh, square root R. And if this is the case, this will show that the width of such a node is square root Ah, because notice that it's, you didn't really need the variables to appear exactly once. It's okay if they appear an odd number of times when you still add equations corresponding to all these triangles, 
uh, because the variables appear an odd number of times, they will not cancel out. Uh, they will still remain in the new equation, which is derived by adding everything. So there will be about square root r variables, which will remain in the equation obtained by adding the kind of small equations corresponding to each of these triangles. And this would be very nice, except it's actually false as stated. Uh, but it's sort of true. And I'll, I'll say sort of what modification needs to be done. So this picture, as I said, is slightly misleading, but uh, not, not horribly so. So the issue is that, recall that our simplicial complex, I also kind of men uh, mentioned uh, tetrahedra or uh, uh, faces of uh, dimension three or kind of sets of size four. And if you look at all four triangles which are present in a single tetrahedron, then all edges, uh, all six of the edges appear an even number of times. So these are four triangles which have no edges on the topological boundary or no edges appearing an odd number of times. And in particular, if you can consider a collection of triangles which are just union of disjoint tetrahedra, then nothing appears an odd number of times. Uh, no variables or no edges appear odd number of times. So in truth, we have to work with a space which is the kind of space of triangles when you think of it as a vector space um, quotiented by uh, the the span of uh, kind of indicator vectors of tetrahedra, uh, and you have to kind of translate the notions of uh, width and uh, the the Benson Wigdorsen argument to work uh, over this kind of quotient space. But it's sort of morally the same argument. And but once you are kind of working in this space, you can apply Gromov's filling inequality and then kind of carry out the argument I mentioned on the previous slide. Another issue is that. You also need to prove soundness that uh, the instance you constructed uh, is not satisfiable. In fact, is far from satisfiable. And in random instances, this can be just done by choosing this uh, right-hand sides uh, given by beta at random. Uh, for every equation, you choose the right-hand side at random. And if you fix a single assignment to all variables for random right-hand sides, there is uh, exponentially small probability that more than 51% of the constraints are satisfied by a given fixed assignment. And the probability is so small, it's exponential in the number of equations that you can actually take a union bound over all assignments and it just doesn't happen. We are trying for an explicit beta, uh, something which is constructible in polynomial time and in particular is not random and we don't quite have the luxury of taking a Chernoff bound. So here we'll use some sort of topological expansion properties um, of the LSV complex to find uh, a good uh, beta, which, which gives us this sort of soundness property. Okay. And again, tetrahedra kind of show up. So uh, in particular, we choose a beta, which is still a function from the space of triangles to F2. So just uh, labeling of all equations with zero one as the right hand side, which has two properties. First, no assignment to the edges, which are the variables of our equation satisfies all the constraints. So the, the beta is such that the system of equations is not satisfiable. I'm just, seems like this is the property we want. I'm just stating it up front, but I'm not saying it's far from satisfiable. I'm, I'm just saying it's not satisfiable. Okay, and I'll tell you how to find it or I'll say a little bit. But then secondly, we also want an additional property that these betas are not sort of quite independent across triangles. In, in particular, if we look at all four triangles which participate in a single tetrahedron, Recall that all edges in a single tetrahedron appear an even number of times if you go over all triangles, which means if you look at the left-hand sides for all these equations, they will just add up to zero. So the right-hand sides better add up to zero if the SOS is supposed to think that these equations are satisfiable. This is a local check just on four triangles, which can be used to check whether the system is satisfiable or not. So it at least should look locally satisfiable. So we will choose betas in a way that for every tetrahedron, the four right-hand sides for the four uh, triangles in that tetrahedra, uh, tetrahedron add up to zero. And uh, this can be done. And in particular, uh, this is related to a space called the cohomology, which is the kind of the quotient of uh, all the betas which satisfy the second property and don't satisfy the first one. So the quotient of all betas satisfy the satisfying second property uh, with respect to all betas which actually do arise from uh, 
edge assignments. Um, uh, the, the ratio of these two is called the cohomology and uh, Lubotsky, Samuels and Vishnay actually proved that the, the, uh, the, the cohomology and in particular, this is called the second cohomology of the simply shell complex is non-trivial. And so you can find uh, a beta which uh, uh, satisfies both the things that I wrote above. Uh, but such a beta guarantees that the instance we get is unsatisfiable. You cannot completely satisfy all constraints. We still need a little more to say that it's actually far from satisfiable. And this comes from a property called, or this is a consequence of a property called co-systolic expansion, uh, proved by Avra and Kaufman, where uh, you can show that once you pick a beta satisfying the above properties, uh, it's not just something which is not satisfiable by edge assignments, but it's actually far from anything which can be satisfied by edge assignments. So it's sort of like a code, this quotient space, the cohomology, and uh, it's at least uh, mu far for some uh, fixed constant mu, which means that uh, no more than one minus mu fraction of our equations are satisfiable. Once you have this kind of a beta, there is an efficient description for these and you can actually explicitly pick one of them. Uh, you get an instance and roughly using the kind of anal sort of analysis I mentioned, uh, you can prove the soundness and completeness. I'll not say much more about the proof uh, right now, but uh, you're welcome to ask more questions in the Slack channel for the paper or just send one of the authors an email and we'll be happy to answer or you can catch us during one of the break times in, in ITCS. Uh, and just in terms of open problems, yeah, I mean, this is barely just kind of scratching the surface of connections between high dimensional expanders and SOS in some sense. There is this kind of weird contrast between the vertex variable and the edge variable uh, constructions. So there's something which would be better to uh, kind of understand more deeply. Uh, we currently stop at square root log n levels. And uh, if you think, uh, about it. I mean, the, the square root log n kind of comes for the same reason why some of the earlier gaps stopped at uh, log n levels when working with uh, random sparse graphs. Just like uh, uh, a random sparse graph uh, looks like uh, uh, a tree up to radius log n. Uh, and in also explicit constructions like the LPS expander is the quotient of uh, an infinite uh, tree which looks uh, like the tree for log n uh, uh, size balls. Um, uh, the, the LSV complex or the Ramanujan complex looks like an object called um, an affine building up to radius uh, log n. And that's where this square root log n comes from. You apply actually Gromov's filling inequality in this affine building rather than uh, in the complex itself. Uh, but for, for random graphs, uh, we do know gaps uh, which can go beyond uh, the girth uh, there uh, or the log n. Uh, and so it's possible that here also we can go beyond the square root log n, although we don't quite know how to do that yet. And of course, it will be great to have further applications of high dimensional expanders and understand the, the, the connections to other areas in theoretical computer science uh, better. Uh, thank you for your attention. You're welcome to join us uh, in the conference discussions or in the session for the paper or, or on Slack and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, come up there.